We're being feast upon by other countries. This is the definition of weakness. I'm a risk taker. I know, so I know you I'm are. A risk -taker. I know you are. I ask for forgiveness. I love the fact that, that we're starting this off by Byron Donald admitting that he's a risk taker. I think we're rolling on that, Mr. Congressman. We are. <laughs> Look, I listen, I, um, my mother would tell you, my teachers would tell you, I've never really been one to ask for permission. I ask for forgiveness. Yes. But I think, honestly, in life, you have to see a star and you chart that course and you just go get it. And that mentality, forget politics, forget everything else, that mentality in life, I think, is what breeds success mm -hmm. in a lot of people. You can't listen to what everybody's saying. You can't be conformed to what everybody says the pathway is. Right. You have to see the goal and just go for it. And you might fail. I remember my first uh, congressional race 2012. I didn't win. I lost. I came in fifth out of six people. I won my county. People say, oh, you lost. The way I looked at it was I failed forward. Okay. I was a better person. Mm -hmm. I knew more about myself. I knew what I could deal with, what I could take, what I couldn't having gone through that process, even though I wasn't successful. He just went right into his talking points. He just went right down the list. Check, 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 check. That, that, was, that was right off the bat. It's real. I love it. Okay, officially, welcome, Byron Donalds from Florida, the great state of Florida, soon to be my home state of Florida, and the great state of Texas as well, Wesley Hunt. Thank you for being here, thank both you. of you. Thank you for having this us. This is the first time I've ever done on the Sage Deal show. Two people. You're my first victims. Here we go. <laughs> Get comfortable. We're in the Pick hot your poison, Georgia heat. Pick your poison. Get comfortable. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, we have you not asking for forgiveness. You just do that. You're a risk taker. And then we got the cowboy boots. Texas. So you're, you're bringing it. Oh, Texas. Heck yeah. And in fact, my wife says you're not buying any more boots because they can't fit in the closet anymore. Are you serious? Oh my gosh. How many do you have? It's a problem. <laughs> I'm not, I don't want to talk about it. It's a problem. It's a problem? It. It's a problem. Come on. It, I, I have 11 pairs of boots. 11. 11. Are they like Lucchese, like the fancy? Most of them are Lucchese, See, yes. are you impressed that I knew that? I'm actually thoroughly impressed. See? I, I was, Why I, are you moving to Florida? You, you should be coming to Texas. Listen, those are the only two states I would move to. Yeah, oh, And Tennessee. And we Tennessee. We all know why. Right? <laughs> Tennessee, why? Tennessee, Tennessee, why Tennessee why works. Why being state number Tennessee three and state number two when you or could obviously be in state number one? <laughs> this is easy stuff. We all, easy. Know everything, we all know everything is bigger and better in Texas. Everyone knows that. You that's, know it. I know it. Everybody knows That's not what I heard. That's, that's what I know. That's not what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be the best hour ever. <laughs> it is. I will say, I love your state. Austin's a little interesting, but I like it. Um, I just like, oh, wait, sorry. Your Austin, state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, your Austin, state. Austin's, I like our Austin's ocean. Yes. Peninsula, baby. Peninsula life. I mean, that's the one thing. You can go way down to the Gulf of Corpus Christi, right? But, I mean, I got... Mexico is not it. I, I got I to give them that. I, I got to give them the beaches. I got the Atlantic Ocean in Fort Lauderdale where I'm going. I'm and just I, saying. You can visit. Feel I, free. I will, I will visit. Listen, man, the water, too. Aqua. Yes. Aqua, baby. <laughs> you don't got to go to the Caribbean. Hit Fort oh, Lauderdale. Man. He probably has, like, you know, Texas turquoise aqua jewelry. I don't know, do they? <laughs> I'm trying. Is that, is that North Texas? I'm trying to help you. <laughs> Let's talk about taxes. I mean, uh, don't yeah. say that. <laughs> Let's talk about it. I mean, wherever you want to go, if you want to go here, we'll taxes, do it. the economy, inflation, the border. There's there's a lot to talk about. And actually, let me really start by having you all explain why we're here in Atlanta. I, I'll just say this, tomorrow night, so when you all see this, this will have already passed, but we're gonna talk about important things that are gonna make it worth watching. Tomorrow night is the first presidential debate here in Atlanta, so that's why everybody is here. And needless to say, I can't wait, leave that alone. Um, with that though, was it your idea to have the little shindig that we're having tonight yeah, here so, in Atlanta? So we started off as a, a Congress cognac and cigars. Cognac, con Congress, cognac, and cigars. Yeah. yeah, and we started off in Philly, and Byron's a very good friend of mine, as you can see. I mean, he's one, he's one, he's one of my best friends on Capitol Hill. And the idea of us being one of four black Republicans and being able to take the message of what it means to be conservative to the black community is something that my team thought of, thought about. And the first person that came to mind to join us in this, in this, in this endeavor was Byron. As you can see, authentic. Um, he understands the community. He understands his background. He understands how to articulate exactly what we need to articulate to our community. And to team up with him on an endeavor like this has been too much fun. And who doesn't like cognac? We love cigars. 
And why not just go have a nuanced conversation yeah. in the black community and talk about, let's, let, let's talk Turkey. We have, let's talk about taxes. Let's talk about immigration. Let's talk about crime. And it's the idea of telling people this, especially black people, you don't have to be a Democrat. Here's two examples. We, he and I have been black for a very long time, <laughs> for like our entire lives, you know what I mean? And we see American issues being black issues. Just that conservatives haven't gone to the community, gone to, gone to the black community and explained it in a nuanced way in order uh, to get the black vote more for conservatives, which we believe is in the best interest of not just the community, but the entire country as a whole. What did he say to you when he shared this idea with you? And what was your initial reaction? Cigars, cognac? Cigars and cognac, let's I, go talk. Stop. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> that's all he said. Yeah, I was, yeah, cigars, cognac? Yes, I'm, I'm there. Yes. I'm, I'm there. there, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The way he mentioned it, I was excited. I, I, I go, okay, I could be a part of this. Because I think people, people are always wondering, especially on the outside of politics, how come you Republicans aren't doing this? How come you Republicans aren't doing that? What people don't understand is that you have the party, which is really focused on legal challenges and dealing with uh, uh, ballot integrity and that kind of stuff. And then you have elected representatives and the elected representatives are doing their job. They're, they're raising money to continue to go back and do their job. They're doing stuff in their districts. Mm -hmm. And so what it takes is for members to, to take a step back from the hamster wheel that members of Congress and uh, elected officials, you know, state reps, state senators, even local officials, uh, county commissioners, city council members, school board members, you're on this hamster wheel as an elected official. So for Wesley to take a step back and say, here's what I want to do, which is outside of the other things we got to do, would you join me? I was like, dude, I'm in. Let's get it. Yeah. Philadelphia, Atlanta, do you have any others and, coming and, up? And hopefully Milwaukee right before Mil yeah, the, the convention. convention. Yep, makes sense. Um, gosh, there's so much to dive into. I want to say thank you, first of all, for asking me to be involved. It's something that I have longed for, just to have discussions yeah. and conversation. Um, and you said it a minute ago, Wesley, uh, black people, you don't have to be a Democrat. And if you want to, great. The point is, uh, why? Why is that a thing? Why, everywhere we go around the country, if you're not a Democrat, it's like, what? And sometimes we know what can come of that, and it can yeah. be quite ugly. Yeah. Why do you think that exists? Well, I think Byron said, uh, set up in Philly, he goes, look, we just want to have a conversation. We don't want vitriol. We don't want hate. We don't want to get into a fight. I just want, we want you to understand. We want to listen to you, but we also want you to listen to us as well so we can, so we can explain this. And Look, you know, my parents grew up in a segregated South. My dad's 75 years old. Your father, you mentioned, is 78 years old. My father's my, my, father's my hero. Yeah, same. And my dad retired lieutenant colonel in the military, served for a very long time. And my dad would always tell me, he goes, son, I had it difficult. You don't have it difficult. He would tell me that often. And there was a time in this country to where you voted Democrat because your mama voted Democrat and your grandma voted Democrat and your granddad, and, and, and you're supposed to do it without asking questions because that was the time. We've evolved. We've changed. Byron and I are two congressmen from white majority districts that President Trump would have won by 20 plus points, and we both won overwhelmingly as black men. We are literally living Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. We're being judged not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. Yes. And so whenever we take this message to people, a lot of people, they're, they're slack-jawed. They cannot believe it because they don't think that we exist. But we exist because we aren't really talking about race. We're talking about the country and what's important for everyone. And with that said, Byron's background, my background, look, my parents are from New Orleans. My parents are from the hood. I get it. My mom participated in, in the uh, civil rights movement. But the value that they raised us, that, that, they, that they imbued within my brother, sister, and I, that's why we all, all three was, went, to, went to West Point, those are conservative values. They are. And the Democrat Party right now doesn't hold those values. And so at some point, we have to look at each other and say, am I going to vote a certain way because we have traditionally, or am I going to vote my best interest? Or am I going to vote with people that share the values that I grew up with? And most of the country is actually right, center right. Yep. So they are going to try to divide us based on racial lines, race, religion, color, creed. If you don't agree with them, you're racist. If you're black, you're an Uncle Tom. I can tell you right now, Uncle Tom, that's, that's a lot. How about like a, 
like a first cousin or second cousin once removed, something like that. I mean, that's kind of harsh, you know, uncle. But I, I take that, I say that in a snarky way because, again, we love black people. We care about black issues. We care so much that we are willing to take this message to the black community and take all the heat rounds that go with it. But what we do know is if we capture one or two people, then we've changed the world. And that's what this is all about. Mm -hmm. What gives you hope that you can cap capture one or two or more? I said a couple hours ago because I'm, my, I'm hopeful because black people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Uh, the issues that have, that have been in the black community, they haven't changed. Same issue set. Politicians come around, say, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do this for you. Has anything changed? No. I think you have to look at the actual economic issues, the academic issues, and the cultural issues, and then make a decision, do I want better? Um, the school choice movement, which is now all in vogue in the United States, yeah. where did a lot of that start with? Black moms in the inner city yeah. saying, my son, my daughter isn't getting what they need. I have to go somewhere else. That's my story, Sage. My mother did that for me. So, you know, coming up, getting into politics, people are like, well, why are you so passionate about education? Because that's the thing that changed my life. Yeah. There were no school vouchers. There was no scholarship programs. My mother had to make an economic decision, a budgetary decision to say, I'm not going to get a car. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that because my son needs this. Um, you look at just the economy overall, everybody's struggling. If you're a fat cat, you know, Democrat billionaire, all right. And you and you're making money off of all the programs that Joe Biden has run through the last three years. You're doing fine because you have federal federal government money coming in, plowing into your contracts, mixing it with your money. You're going out making profits. Who cares what inflation is? You were if you were a black family in Atlanta, price of food up anywhere from 25 to 40 percent. Struggling. The price of getting your used car repaired up 50 percent. 50 percent. The price of getting your car repaired. Three years. My radiator isn't working. I got to figure out my transmission. I got to change my tires. I got, a, I got an offender bender. I got to replace some mirror. All that stuff goes into your pocketbook. Then you t and, you, and then you go back to the education issues. We watched the Democrats lock black kids out of schools for two years. What kids were being locked out of schools? Black kids, Hispanic kids, poor white kids. They are now academically behind for two years. So then what America are they going to inherit? Are they going to be ready for what is necessary going forward? Those are the issues that really matter. Not, not the historical view of how black people have voted in this country. It is about what is happening today. today. Mm -hmm. What's going to matter going forward tomorrow? Because that's what's going to allow for black people to step into the, the fullness of America to be able to compete amongst other races, to be able to achieve with other races. And look, we're doing it now. That's the crazy part. You have very successful black people in our country. So their, their success, Wesley talked about our successes, their successes could not even be fathomable in 1950 America. Not even close. Not close. Yep. The level of successes that exist today, obviously we have our athletes, obviously we have our entertainers, you have black business owners growing, becoming bigger. You have a whole, a whole new uh, line of guys in, in private equity, in the hedge fund world. Big time. In finance, in law. We need to celebrate those things, but that doesn't mean you stop. You make sure the policy is together. You make sure the policy is right. The Democrat Party, their policy is terrible. It's not going to work. So that's why we go out on the road and take that message everywhere. The thing is... We, we know it's not going to work because it has not already for years and years and years. Um, I have this conversation a lot, actually, just, again, trying to have the conversation. Just in the last three years, tell me what's better. Tell me what's better. And that doesn't go for just the black people, everyone. Hispanic people. That's for everyone. You get the holy hush on that question. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's what comes. 100%. Yeah. And slash or it goes to, I know, but... Donald Trump, da 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 da, da. And, I, and I'm like, it's so weak. Yeah, like, it's not like, gonna work. So, so I think if we're focusing on the black vote, black people know that. Why has there not been a change up until now when we're all smart enough to see based on what? The grocery store, getting that radiator fixed. But there's still this hesitation. Well, what I'm seeing is this. 
we had, this was one of the few times in American history where you have had a president and then you have it for four years. Then you have a different president for four years. And then the other president is running against the current president again. It's crazy. So we can look at this and say, I was alive and well four years ago. Mm. This is actually, not eight, not eight years, four years ago, there was a precipitous fall off and a precipitous decline. And for lack of a better word, I don't have the, the vernacular to even describe it, for everything. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris happened. And then you have President Trump that then comes back and says, I'm back. <laughs> do you miss me? And a lot of people are saying, yes, we do miss you. Or they're whispering Oh, they whisper it. it. Or, oh, they're, oh, he and I will be walking through the airport and somebody will tap me on the shoulder. Hey, Wes, I just want to let you know. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. But if they were a Biden supporter, it's just, oh, how dare you? How can you do these things? It's insulting to those that remain quiet. But that silent majority is alive and well. That's what we see every day. People don't want to be criticized. It's hard. People don't want to get in fights with family members and lose friends. That's hard. Byron and I are cut from the same cloth. You know, I'm an Apache pilot. I don't care. Uh, if you don't like me, I'll, somebody else will. Yeah. Byron's from New York. I don't care. <laughs> Byron's from New York. We're cut from the same cloth, and if we aren't voices for these people to represent them, then they have no voice at all. And there's no one to look up to, and they could say, you know what, I'm not going to walk to Thanksgiving dinner and start hurling out how I feel about Donald Trump, but see, these two guys, I got you. I see it. I got you. And then lastly, I'll say this, Sage. The last couple of weeks, President Trump raised almost $500 million. Crazy. You know, that bank account looked good, man. It's a record. It's looking good. The most money raised in two weeks for a presidential candidate in the history of this country. Where would that come from? I can tell you it's not tech Democrat billionaires. It's everyday mom and pop that just looking around and say, here's 20 bucks here, here's five bucks here. I can't take it anymore. We are seeing this in droves. And money always talks. So the silent majority is very real. Byron and I are the ones that are willing to be vocal about it and to let the people know that we will be your voice. Mm. Well... I love that people are coming up to you, and that surprises me. Not at all, that people are coming up to you uh, publicly, privately, probably on social media as well, um, which speaks volumes. The fear thing is real. And I get frustrated sometimes because people will say the same thing to me quietly, like, thank you. I'm like, of course, but, but I, we need your help. Like, yes. this is not going to happen if you live in fear. Again, I started to say to talk about empathy because empathy is everything. I understand why people stay silent. Yeah. We all have experienced it. I, I always say I'm a prime example of, of, of why people just stay quiet because you get canceled. You get canceled. And how do you pay your bills? And how do you take care of your kids? And how do you do those things? I get it. I've been on the floor sobbing. Like, I, I get it. You overstand. Yeah. And then with that, that exists. Are you going to be able to be okay with yourself by being silent when so much is at risk? Are you telling me that there was never a fear with either one of you two when you were younger, knowing I had these feelings, but I'm going to get ostracized in my community if I'm true to myself? Were there, was there ever a time where you thought, this is a lot, and I don't know? Oh, yeah. A lot of times. Um, but then I look at my sons. My oldest son is 20. Going to graduate college next year. 16-year-old, 13-year-old. And for me, the first thought after you, get that, you hit that fear wall is, but what lesson, am I, what lesson am I teaching them? That you feel so passionately about something, you truly believe in something, and then you have the facts behind you, but you're going to let the world tell you you're wrong? Like some of the great inventions in our, in our, in our economy um, were pushed by people who were told, no, 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 that yep. won't work. Yep. And then you had to look at that and say, no, this is going to work. And you move forward. And a lot of times that, that road is a lonely one. That's a, that's a road you walk by yourself. But I will tell you, even, you know, through this journey the last several years now being at the national level in politics, there's times where I've thought to myself, man, Byron, you might want to just ratchet this thing down a little bit and just chill out. But then honestly, Sage, I saw your story. And I watched podcasts, I listened to you and everything, and you coming out and telling your story and the things that happened. And watching you do that, I'm like, well, then what am I worried about? She's opening up what, things that are personal that she never wanted to cover. And now she's letting it be known. That gave me fuel to say, well, shoot, all I'm doing is talking about public policy. And all I'm talking about is saying that 
Donald Trump is the person to lead this country. That when you see people take that journey and take that step, what it does, I believe it fuels more people. I'll tell you a quick story on this. Um, George Washington University, I was there when they still had the encampments going on. Mm. And so the university president told us that the, most of the people in these encampments didn't even go to GW. They are people from outside. Oh. They are paid agitators. Sick. We've all seen them. So I go, we're talking about, are we going to go see the encampments? I'm like, let's go. So we're walking through the encampments, and I'm taking on protesters and encampment people left and right, and I hear this voice over my shoulder. And this voice is saying, yeah, get off my campus. Yeah, you don't belong here. Yeah, you don't belong here. When I walked up, I didn't see anybody doing that. I looked over my shoulder. It was a Jewish student. Goes to GW. He might have been 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, he saw me taking them on. He's like, well, if he's taking them on, I could take them on. Wow. And, and having the strength and the will to step through when everybody says you shouldn't or you can't or that, that fear wall where we all hit it. We all hit the fear wall. But walking through that, what you realize, what you begin to realize is there is the silent majority like Wesley's talking about. There are people out there who are saying, I do agree with that. Thank you for saying that. Keep going. So when he's in the airport, I'm in the airport, you're in the airport, and people come up and they go, thank you. I'm, I'm really glad you, you're speaking that way. It gives you the fuel yeah. to power. continue. Hi, guys. Thanks again for watching my new show. Today, I want to really thank you by telling you about something great, meat. So there's a company called Good Ranchers, and they're America's number one meat delivery service. And they just launched their new King Box full of thick-cut bone-in ribeyes, which are my favorite, center-cut filet mignons, and thick-cut bone-in New York strips. All of them are sourced from local family farms and aged 21 days to perfection. Buy one today before they sell out at GoodRanchers.com. Good Ranchers is offering free bacon for life with any new subscription. And if you use my code SAGE, you'll receive two packs of Good Ranchers uncured Applewood smoked bacon with every single order. So go to GoodRanchers.com and subscribe to any of their custom curated boxes filled with 100% American beef, chicken, pork, or wild caught seafood. Use my code SAGE at checkout to claim your free Applewood smoked bacon for life. If needed any other reason to support Good Ranchers, they're not only amazing partners of my show, thanks again, but they support the paralyzed veterans of America too. Every order saves American farms and supports American veterans. So change the way you buy meat today at GoodRanchers.com. Use my code SAGE to claim your free bacon for life. What was the turning point for, for both of you? Do you want to start? Like, because I assume, yes, that you had that moment too where you thought, well. <laughs> I've had, so my life was changed drastically after combat. Mm -hmm. And so when I was, you know, 23, 24 years old, leading people into combat, getting shot at by a, a Russian-made 50, 50 caliber machine gun flying around Baghdad, and then to land and to thank God that you land only to get up the next morning and then do it again. Because if I don't do my job, that somebody on the ground might not get to go home to see their parents again. So therefore, I must do my job for them because I took an oath to do it. Yeah. You do that 55 times, it creates a different human being when you come out on the other side. Now, most people don't have that kind of experience, thank God. And I thank God that less than 1% of this country is willing to step into the breach literally to do that. But that's when I became a very fearless person at that point. West Point helped out, but it was combat in 2006 that completely changed my outlook on life. At that point, for the rest of my life, I felt like I'm living on borrowed time. A lot of my classmates did not make it back alive. I'm surprised I made it back alive on some nights, to be honest with you. The fact that I did, I feel like I owe it to those that did not make it back in one piece to continue to find ways to serve because they can't serve for themselves. How can I possibly be a coward if for some reason I made it back for whatever reason they did not and I don't speak up like this, and I don't live my life without fear and taking care of this country, taking care of, our poster, taking care of our posterity. If I don't do that, then I besmirch the death of my fallen classmates, and I will never do that. Can I get Kleenex? <laughs> Sorry. That's just <laughs> Sorry. Damn you. Shit. As long as y'all got the slapping. Sorry. <laughs> as long as you got the slapping. That's all that matters. Oh, I, I, know, I will be I know keep it rolling. Uncle, I know keep it rolling this fine. Your uncle and your father. No, you but like that. what you're saying is just, it's everything. I also think from a very selfish personal level for a moment, it's just such relief almost to hear two strong, brilliant 
kind, good-spirited black men Thank you. say it. Thank you. You know, and I know there's more. I'm just, I don't get to, I don't get to see this in person. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a relief if that makes sense. I think there's a lot of young black kids and contemporaries who are our age group. Yeah. Who are this way. They think this way, maybe not politically the way I do, but they, um, they are leaders in their community. They coach kids in their community. Uh, they might be teachers in their community. There's a value system that they want to instill in the next generation. Yeah. Um, they are no nonsense about that approach. They don't get covered. They don't have, yeah. you know, they don't have hundreds of thousands or millions of followers. They don't do TV interviews and, and stuff like that. But they're out there. I know they're out there because I've seen them just in the lives of my sons. Strong men who have standards, who have a vision of, of how things are supposed to be. And I think that the critical uh, issue for America right now is translating what we know occurs in every community of this country and having that translate into the political realm and into the media realm. Well, that's a whole other issue, whole other issue. problem. Well, yeah. it's, the, it's the same problem. Because I would argue yeah. the same gatekeepers in the political realm are the same gatekeepers in the medium realm. That's in the media true. realm. And, and frankly, at higher education realm. They are the same people. They're the same cohort. They're the same ideology. Um, they are the ones that would rather delude people into thinking things that are just not biologically possible. So they <laughs> yeah. would rather delude you. I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you about that in a second. So, oh, it's, let's go. Well, right. It's so crazy. Like, listen, I got kids. I got boys. My boys. I, from when they were little, I always tell people, "Oh, that's so nice. You have boys. You're raising nice boys." I'm not raising boys. I'm raising men. Mm. They are men. That's who they're supposed to become. And so to put men in a sport against a female, that's just crazy to me. And I think that that issue amongst a lot of these new issues that have cropped up, that's crazy to men in America writ large. That's part of the reason you're starting to see now these political shifts in America. That's a good thing because what it means is that you have people who have value systems, who have character. Yeah. Who have, a, who have a stature in their community, who are looking at all these issues and they're saying, no, yeah. I'm not with this anymore. We got to do something different. And so I think the purpose of what we're doing is saying, well, hey, bruh, here's the difference. The difference is here. Come join us. Politically, because, the difference is us. here politically. There we go. Politically. Join us. You know, the A word is something I grew up with as a daughter of a West Point father, yeah. uh, accountability. Yeah. Mm. And people don't like that word. No. I'm not saying I always like it either, right? Whether it's us, our children, teachers, our leaders at the very, very top, they don't like that word. But I think it has to start internally, each one of us. And if we don't have, if we don't hold ourselves accountable to do the right thing, even when it's uncomfortable, That's correct. then what? Then we, like, we got nothing. So I think by you being here today, tomorrow, um, our event tonight, I'm so excited because it's, it's to try to talk face to face as black men and say, listen, we are in this together yeah. and you cannot be lazy. Frankly, it's laziness to choose to not educate ourselves about the facts and then make decisions based on facts, not feelings. Not feeling, because mm. <laughs> facts don't care about your feelings. They do not. And how long have we been told that as kids? I, I, my whole life, yes. So, I mean, it is like a grassroots movement almost that it needs to be to say, let's just sit and talk. Ask me any question you want, but these are the facts. And then you got to take time on your own to do it for yourself and for your family. What will it take? Will it take these conversations? Will it take, I mean, people losing their paychecks more so as far as taxes? Like, I, I don't know. To me, I'm shocked that it got to this point. So we're on the ground and we see it every single day. What it's, what it's taking is, it's taking Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. We are $35 trillion in debt. We are running a $2 trillion annual deficit. We've had 11 million people enter our country illegally. This is the highest inflation I have seen in 40 years, my entire lifetime. Communities don't feel safe anymore. He was talking about fentanyl earlier. Enough fentanyl has poured into this country to kill every single American six times. Yeah. That's what's happening. Yeah. That's why you see President Trump raising $500 million. That's what's happening. The canary is in the coal mine right now. And you're, you're watching it happen live. 
We have never seen it like this in the history of this, in, in our lifetime, maybe even in the history yeah, of this country. Okay. And you know, one thing I always tell people is this, they'll walk up to me and Wesley, you know, how do you do politics? You know, I just, Wesley, I, I just don't do politics. I said, well, <laughs> politics does you. Hell yeah, it does. So if you don't, and if you don't pay attention to it, and if you don't vote, then you are, if your absence from participating in this process is you saying, is you saying that I am okay with the status quo. But we know the status quo is broken. So if you don't want to fix it, then raise your hand and blame yourself and look at yourself in the mirror. Mm -hmm. But people want to change. And if you're looking at the polling right now, President Trump is in every, up in every single swing state. They are hemorrhaging the black vote right now. And they brought in Kamala Harris to shore up the black vote. And the only thing she did was ruin it. Because at the end of the day, black people look at her and they say, look, I'm all for diversity or whatever, but I'm not for stupid either. Mm -hmm. I want competent people leading us. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I don't care what you look, look like because I can't afford to fix my car and I can't afford to buy groceries right. and I can't afford to buy medicine. So at this point, you talking about racism and you talking about this, that, and the third, that's not important to me right now. I just want to live. And with everything being up 50% at a minimum on any kind of good in this country is destroying the middle class. It is destroying people. This is why people are waking up right now. And, it, you know, I remember in 2020, uh, in 2020, it, it was kind of like that. But mortgage, the mortgage rate was at two and a half. I, I refried right. my house at two and a half percent. And although it was COVID, everybody was buying new cars like hotcakes and, and everybody was living large. And then three years later, since COVID, what happened? What happened? There's no excuse for it. We have to get back to this. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I'm from Texas. Energy. Mm. Why are we destroying our energy sector? Why are we relinquishing our power to Venezuela and all these other real countries? We, we can literally provide our own energy right here in this country because God gave us the Permian Basin and the Marcella Shale. We have it right here. And we refuse to use it. Why do you think? The agenda. Yeah. No, but, but how does that help anyone? I, I, I really sometimes go, why? And when you don't have an answer, I'm like, it's just, is it just pure evil that, that's and control? Answer. Like, I'll go out there with it. Like, that doesn't make sense. It's control. There's a, in the Democratic left, and I'll back up. You said something. I love the way you said it. I say it this way to people who say, how do you do politics? Yeah. That's, a, that's a big question. I always tell people, you may not care about politics, but politics cares about, about you. you. Yeah. Oh, if politics cares about you. Because they just want you to, that's, why, that's where all the sloganeering comes from. That's where the gaslighting comes from. The gaslighting, the innuendo, the narratives. All of that is because politics cares about people, whether they may not care about politics. So that's why people have a responsibility to, to engage. But I think, but overall to the to energy, what, what Wesley was talking about, to the agenda. There is an agenda that wants America to be in line with other countries in the world. In the core of the Democrat Party today is an, ideology, is, an, is an ideology that America is too big, too powerful, too in control, too industrial. You now have these knucklehead people defaming Stonehenge, yeah. running on the field during the congressional baseball game destroying a couple of games ago, destroying, destroying the Mona, the Mona Lisa. Lisa, saying they're here to save the planets, looking like damn fools. And I'm going to call it, they're looking like damn straight up fools. <laughs> bothering other people just trying to live their lives. Meanwhile, the people who are pushing this from the top, they're flying private jets all the time. I don't see them on Delta. <laughs> no. I have never seen Taylor Swift. They're not on Frontier. <laughs> on United. I they're not, not on I Frontier. I have not seen T-Swift on, on No, no, no. She's not on the United no, no. flight. Not even her. first class. I didn't see her. She's not there. No. So these people will say, you, we have to change everything, but they won't change their own lives. And that's how to. you know it's, it's phony. In our country... Obviously, in Texas, oil rich throughout the entire west of America, massive deposits of, of oil and natural and gas. Minerals and, and minerals. We could do it all here in the United States. The other thing we have in the United States, which we started, by the way, you go see the movie Oppenheimer where they talk about it. Great movie, by the way. We have it here in the United States. We can mine for uranium. We get it from the Russians. Nobody likes to talk about that, Michael but that's where we get it from. We can mine for uranium. We can enrich the uranium. We can build not just the big, massive nuclear plants everybody talks about. We now have the technology for the same size nuclear reactors that we have on our nuclear subs that have been in the water for 70 years. Yeah. We can build that stuff all across the country. 
tremendously lowered the cost of energy in our country. Why don't we do that? Because you do have people who go to the World Economic Forum, who listen to these massive international groups, who have said, oh, if we do solar panels and windmills, everything will be okay. That's stupid. You're, number one, you're going to empower the Chinese. Right the Chinese are not our friend. Nope. The China, listen, I want to, real quick, I want to talk to the women of America. Whether you're a suburban mom, you're a single female college educated, you're a single female, no college degree, just working and busting your home, doing whatever. I'll promise you this. The Chinese do not care about women's rights. Mm -hmm. I'll promise you that. And if you look at the history of the world, the dominant economic and military power sets tempo for the overall culture of the world. It was that way when the British were the dominant mm -hmm. power. It was that way when the Spanish were the dominant the Romans, power. The it was that way when the Romans were the dominant power. It was that way when the Greeks were the dominant power. When America has been the dominant power on the globe, more people have come out of poverty. More women have been able to not just get the right to vote, the right to have property, to have expanses in their, in their academic and their economic attainment. And the ability, professional. Oh, mm -hmm. Professional For attainment, sure. all that stuff. <laughs> I mean. You know, so women's rights have flourished when America is the dominant power on the globe. These knucklehead people would rather China be empowered. That's to the detriment of women, frankly, yes. in the United States. So you cannot follow that kind of agenda. And then you actually get to the technology. Solar panels are more dirty than natural gas. When you, dig, when you dig up the minerals and you dispose of the panels and everything in between, it, it is decomposes. dirtier than natural never gas. Decomposes. Never decomposes. Wow. The radical left won't tell you this. They just say, Green New Deal, Green New Deal, we're saving the planet. No, they're not. They are, not only are they going to hurt the planet more, they're going to destroy the purchasing power of poor people in our country in that process. Correct. It's devastating. We can do significantly better. And I want to talk about America. You hit something. America first. What does that mean? It's an ideology that's different from, from, the, from the LS. I want uh, the American taxpayer to be number one and to be the priority on everything. And I am unapologetic about that. Yeah. I don't want parity with anyone. No. I want to be the best at everything because this is America. Mm -hmm. This is a melting pot. This is one of the only places in the entire world where you could have people from different backgrounds rooted in slavery to Ellis Island that can walk into a room with an American passport and call themselves... Americans. Americans. This is a very special place. I lived in Saudi Arabia. I deployed to Baghdad. I've been on every single continent except for Antarctica. It ain't like that everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so if we relinquish our diversity as a whole, as a country, and allow Chinese, allow, allow the, the, the Chinese, rogue nations, the Middle East to run the world, the world's not in a better place. No. So if we choose not to lead, then we will follow. And the world will follow on a path that nobody wants to see. The left does not understand that. They want parity. They want people to be on our level. Uh, no. I don't That's think not it. Yeah. American exceptionalism. That's not what I fought for. Mm -hmm. We are the best. We will continue to be the best. We'll continue to be at the tip of the spear and lead from the front. That is a different ideology that we have. But it is imminent. Yes. Like, it must happen now. To me, we're right on the edge of that cliff. We absolutely I are. I think it's happening. I mean, Wesley's talked about the money that's coming to the campaign the last month. I remember seeing Donald Trump 2016 in Fort Myers, Florida. They asked me at the time, I, I, I was running for the state house. They asked me to speak at a Trump rally. I said, of course, I, at first I was like, man, who's this the Trump campaign? Nope. They called my phone, I didn't call them. And I was like, they were like, sir, we want you to come speak at uh, President Trump's, or at the time it was Mr. Trump's rally, because it's 2016, this yeah. is before November. I go, uh, hold on a second. I'm looking at my wife, like, Trump campaign calling me. What, what is this That's about? Wild. What's call. this about? That's wild. So I go, hello? And they go, yeah. And I so I go, well, yeah, I'll do it. Um, it was Jermaine Arena at the time, Hertz Arena now, Estero, Florida. I walk in there. I go up to the podium, give the speech. The arena's three quarters full at that time. 10,000 people outside the arena in the line snaking to get in. I told my friend, I said, listen, when Donald Trump hits this, this podium, He's going to be like Hulk Hogan in WrestleMania. Yeah. This thing's going nuts. Watch what's going to happen. Trump hits the catwalk. Place goes bizarre. Pandemonium. Pandemonium everywhere. I felt, I felt like, you know, um, Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby <laughs> the Brain you know, were calling it live right then and there. I love pro wrestling, by the way. <laughs> love I it. I digress. So I'm watching the whole thing. I tell my friend, I go, dude, that's the next president of the United States. You can't fake that. You cannot. I will tell you, 
these last six to eight months, it's like that and more. I was in the Bronx. I got off the plane. I'm dragging my bag behind me just to make sure I got to the podium before he gets to the podium because the motorcade's moving through, through is moving through Manhattan oh, to yeah. get to the Bronx. Yeah. I got out in the Uber. I'm running up there. I get to the podium. They go, we're putting you on right now. I go straight up the catwalk. I go to the podium in the Bronx. I'm not sure what to really expect. I get to that podium, 10,000 people, black, Spanish, I'm going to expand Spanish, Dominican, Puerto yes. Rican, uh, Honduran, Venezuelan, black people, Haitian people, white people, and they were going nuts for Donald J. Trump. I could not believe the yeah. video. Yeah. And then the interviews with people who look like us, oh, yeah. women. I mean, it was shocking. And then you see AOC the other day with 100 people. I cannot. Running that, around the stage. That I was embarrassed for her. It was terrible. The, and the dancing around. And, no, did you see that? I saw it. You saw it? I saw it a lot. <laughs> and that was ridiculous. But then what happened? Jamal Bowman lost. Oh, yeah. That, badly. Yeah, that was lost, lost badly. badly. And you know what? There's a there's a lot a deeper story with him for sure that we you don't even know. You can't pull fire alarms. To, you can't pull fire alarms. You can't pull fire alarms. alarms. Let's put it that way. We learned that in kindergarten, for goodness sake. <laughs> kindergarten, we're <laughs> Don't, don't, pull fire. don't pull touch fire. the fire alarm. Don't touch the fire um, alarm. Two Let's things. I wanted to just add on a tiny bit to <laughs> America first and our, our greatness because I one thing I always come back to is whenever there is um, a natural disaster, whenever there's a tragedy anywhere on this planet, who do they look to first? Us. America. America. Us. Whether they ask or whether we give, yeah. we're the first ones. And so it, it does make me laugh in many ways where people are, oh, we're, we're anti this and anti that and we're racist and prejudiced. And I'm like, no other country, at least to this level, I don't yeah, know, we behave this way. gives and gives and tries to uplift and help those in need at their darkest moment. That's one of the things that I'm so proud of. We've given the Ukraine $160 billion and counting. And that's just since when? To fix the their border. Years. We ain't fixing our own border. And then we intentionally ignore ours. Let me ask you about... Um, Ooh, real quick. Yeah. Hold on. I know we, we got to touch this. Yeah. Because you brought up what we do for the world. When the world's in trouble, mm -hmm. we show up. Joe Biden, the man is awful. He's terrible at this job. America knows he's terrible at the job. Everyone knows. This is not a conversation. We yeah. have lost seven United States embassies under his presidency. Yes. What does that mean? So we have embassies all over the world yes. in every country. That is essentially sovereign American America territory. Under his watch, we have had to evacuate seven, seven United States embassies. I did not know that. That has never happened in American history. That's how weak never. we are. That's how weak we That's are. That's how America. weak we are on the world stage. What? That's how bad uh, and, it is. Okay, help me. What, why has that happened? Why are we evacuating? Because there's no protection? There's no I'm a, fear? I'm going to say, gonna... real, say real quick, and I'm going to give it yeah, to Wesley. Yeah, yeah. When you are weak and our adversaries know you're weak, they push you. It's no different than, a, than the bully in the schoolyard. If you're timid and the bully knows he can get away with it, what happens? He comes for your lunch money every single week. Yes. Every single day. Until you punch back. Until you punch back. We have been weak under Joe Biden. And so our adversaries around the globe, big and small, know that they can push us. Go ahead, Wesley, you go. You can talk. I'm going to give you my favorite, Trump, my, my favorite President Trump story. This is my number one favorite of all time. When we were negotiating with the Taliban, while President Trump was still the president, um, President Trump wanted to get out of Afghanistan, but he wanted a conditions-based withdrawal. Mm -hmm. Meaning that you do what we tell you to do, and then we will start pulling troops back slowly as long as you abide by our rules. It's President Trump Mike, and Mike Pompeo, and they are talking to Taliban leadership in the room, and they had one translator in the room. President Trump looked at the, at the Taliban leader and said this, I want to leave Afghanistan, but it's going to be a conditions-based withdrawal. And Translator translated. And he said, if you harm a, a hair on a single American, I'm going to kill you. And the translator goes, and Trump goes, tell him, yes. <laughs> yes. tell him what I said. Tell him, tell him what I said. Reached in his pocket, pulled out a satellite photo of the leader, leader of, the, of the Taliban's home and handed it to him. Shut up. Got up and walked out the room. Sure did. Do you know for 18 months not a single American was killed in Afghanistan? Sure did. That's the definition of strength. That's what I'm talking about. And so you could imagine that kind of sentiment being around the world. If we have an embassy in another country, no one's going to touch it because they're going to be fearful that they'll get a Moab on their head. Mm -hmm. That's how President Trump rolls. This is the opposite of strength. This is the definition of weakness.
And so now we're being feast upon by other countries when our embassies are there because the Americans aren't going to do anything about it and they don't want us there anyway. But the point of us having an embassy there and the point of us having sovereign American soul is to be able to keep an eye on the world to a certain extent, to have that presence. But you can't have that presence when you have feckless leadership. That story, I can picture All-time happening. All-time favorite story. Of course it happened. And on the other side, yeah. I interviewed President Biden a month after he took office. Um, he was fine during the interview. And then, but, but actually technical issues leading up to it, I had to fill time. I was like, oh goodness gracious, I got to fill with the sitting president and you know, it's yes. via satellite. And um, he had, tr- I've told this story before, he had trouble finishing his sentence. I remember, I watched, I watched the interview. I was heartbroken. Yeah. Um, and that more off camera is what, what, what people really didn't see where I just kept silent and until recently. Three years ago. This is three, pl- three and a half years ago. And I, so big picture because um, the policies, the way the country's being run, disaster. It's, it's an unmitigated disaster at this point. The human side of that is heartbreaking that his family has allowed this to happen. It's elder abuse. It is 100%. And I say, shame on Dr. Jill Biden. Yes, it's a shame. Shame on his children and those who claim to love him. Because my father is only a couple years younger. Your father's right there too. And I know how devastating it must be from other experiences with family members. Yes. Um, there's no way I would allow that to happen. No, me neither. And, and if for no other reason, obviously for his health, for, but for his pride as a man who needs help yes. right now. Yes. And it is um, dangerous for the country. It's all the things, and it's also heartbreaking in that way. I just wanted to put that out there because Get I think we can, we can separate politics from the human element, yes. and it's disgusting it's wrong. what they have allowed to happen. It's wrong. Um, I want to talk about the percentages, black voters, and how that has evolved, like 2016 to 2020. Um, to what the expectation is. I know you've both been on record with that um, coming up here in 2024. It's interesting because I think um, the number was right around 90% of the black vote that Joe Biden got in 2020, which was low considering what it had been in 16 and certainly in 08. Um, But usually, well, with Obama, it was like 97, 98%, right? Dropped to 90 for Joe Biden in 2020. And of course, we know what happened with that election. Um, So I wonder with some of the conversations that you have been having um, and the polls that we're watching, how much we should expect those numbers to change from 2020? Oh, listen, I think right now, if you were gonna go out today, I probably have President Trump anywhere 16 to 20% of the black vote overall. Total. Today. Total. Black men, you're 25%, it could go higher. I think that now the work that Wesley and I are doing, the work that the Trump campaign is basically fostering now RNC, state parties, outside groups. I think that there's gonna be a much more concerted effort towards targeting black voters from the Republican side of the aisle than has ever occurred uh, in Republican politics since, shoot, probably before Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. If we're gonna be totally blunt about that. Yeah. And so I think what you're gonna see, if that work is done right, it can go as high as 25% because I said at the top, black people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And then the other thing is, what they're also sick of is the same old speeches coming every four years. And now you have have our contemporaries and younger who they didn't, their their age isn't really the 80s and what happened in the LA riots and all that stuff. That's not their worldview. Their worldview is 2000 America, 2010 America, and now. They're they're post they're they're 21st century black voters and they're look that's why if you look at the polling, young black voters, Joe Biden is hemorrhaging young black voters. Yes. It's older yes. black voters who are being loyal to the Democrat Party. It's, it's black voters Burns, under right? it's, it's the, the Clayburns. It's just yeah. And, the, and listen, I get it. I get it. I get it. It's, I get it. it's what it is. I get it. Like, black voters under 50, they're starting. They're looking. They're like, nah, I'm, I'm not with this anymore. Because they're seeing the reality. You said all the disasters. This is why I call him the master of disaster. He He's the master of disaster. Everything has gone wrong. Listen, I challenge any Democrat. Challenge them. Name a topic. Name me something that's gone right. I'll wait. That's what I'm I patient. said. I know. I'll look at my watch I got all day. Ice cream flavors. <laughs> He's been positive for ice cream. That's it. Man, show <laughs> Man, everybody loves ice, ice cream, cream no matter man. what he that's does. Ice cream. That's not my point. He might be good for Ray-Bans. <laughs> I'm, I'm better. Bad, no, he's bad 
No, I'm you better. And I'm gotta, better you and I. I'm better though. You and I gotta make. I'm better for great Ray Ban. Again. Oh yeah, yes I'm you better, are. Better. We gotta make Avery. We gotta make Avery. The, 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 the new manga. <laughs> make Avery great. Again. The, the, the demographic great. needs to evolve. If that's what Ray Ban wants, I don't, the, then you don't no, want no, Ray Ban. No, 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 no. We gotta change. No, no, they're past. They're past. But look, at the end of the day, it can go. I think the the ceiling is thirty percent. That's what I agreed. Agreed. To get from eighteen to thirty is work, effort, focus diligence, turnout, turning people out, and then not just doing, uh, uh, what do we call it? Um, when they do like women for this and, and, and black people for this, so I forget what the, the political yeah. term it's is. Like term, yeah. It's a political term they call for it. It's about relationships, mm -hmm. building these relationships. And you start doing that work now, your ceiling is 30%. You just look at polling, your ceiling's 20%. So how about in a state like Georgia, where we are right now. Yeah. And there has, th this was the center point, the yeah. focus, right? For uh, a long time in 2020, yeah. after, before, during, and after the election. Mm -hmm. um, I remember talking to Joe Biden about this on ESPN and because it was right before Major League Baseball, All-Star Game yeah. was indeed removed from the city because of these allegedly Ridiculous. racist voter laws. I remember being and so- And Colorado. So if, uh, great. <laughs> right? Perfect. <laughs> I remember okay. just being so offended that you don't think we're smart enough to remember to bring an ID, to get a driver's license, to like, uh, stop. It's all lies, yes. but it worked. So why is it gonna be any different? Let's just talk about where we are now because this area of the country matters. So let's look at the, the re most recent election that they just had. Um, you had uh, Kemp versus Abrams. Kemp, white guy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. beat the black woman. Mm -hmm. Just below them was Warnock and Herschel Walker. Yeah. Warnock won. Yeah. So wait a minute. By the skin let's, of his teeth. Let's, Barely, yeah. let's, think, let's, let's, let's think about this. So that's because black men predominantly looked at Stacey Abrams and said, we don't want that. We'll take the white guy because he's better and more qualified to be the governor. Same year, right below that, but you have two black guys, one Democrat, one Republican. The black Democrat won, and I would argue that Herschel may have had a few issues there, but it was very, very tight. It, it was close despite the fact that the campaign, the, the things that came out towards the end of that campaign were, were, were the timing was perfect by the Democrats to get that out, and, and it worked. It, it worked. It yes. worked. They used, the, they, they used their tactics, they and, and, and it worked. And it worked. But what I'm talking about is a highly informed voter block. Right. And that's what Georgia is. So now let's, let's, let's have a little bit of an experiment now. So you now have Biden versus Trump in Georgia. Well, guess what? This is not even a demographic problem. They're both white guys. Mm -hmm. They're going to pick the Republican. Why? Because Biden has been a disaster for the last four years. And that's why President Trump is polling better than Kemp was just two years ago. Interesting. Interesting. Here's, here's my one thing that I don't believe anyone talks about enough. Yeah. Sorry. I think we all know what happened in 2020. People don't want to admit it. Oh, we can admit it. Um, yeah, it's just, oh, are you an election denier? Oh, no. Yes. No. Actually, I, 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 don't, I, I don't believe that uh, the votes were counted properly. I'll leave it at that. Tell me why anyone should trust the system in 2024 if we know that people got away with whatever they wanted in 2020. Well, I think, look, looking at 2020, a couple things. First, in that, in that environment in 2020, that's an anomaly in and of itself. Yes, it is. The True. world was shut down. Yes. The Democrats, if you were in a Democrat-run area— they basically said, you can't go anywhere except to the polls and to go protest. <laughs> Those are the only two things you were allowed you to do. You don't have to have your You can't go to the beach. You can't, can't go, go to the church. beach. You can't go to church. You can't run you outside. You can't do nothing. But if you're protesting, you're allowed. You're fine. And, if you're and, and vote, you're not going to get sick no, and die. No funerals, no nothing. No. And if you're going to vote, you, you, you're good. You can vote. You can go protest. You can't go to the hospitals to see your loved ones. You just say you can't have funerals. Your kids can't go to school. So you have an environment where now people are just back to normal life. There's so many other things happening. I actually think that voter turnout overall is going to be a little bit lower in this election than in 2020. Actually, that's what that's what I think. Mm, really? we'll, see, we'll see what happens. I think uh, number two is the Democrats, they did, they went to every key jurisdiction and they sued to change election procedure. Yes. Well, we don't weeks, have to really. Weeks. Weeks before, before the election. Weeks before. They just said, it's, look, it's like you're playing a Super Bowl and... One coach comes out of halftime and goes to the referees and says, hey, man, I don't like the way they're jamming my receivers. Just, just stop that. Just, you know, 
If, okay. they, if, they, if they hit them, you got to throw the flag immediately. And they tell one coach, not the other. Mm-hmm. That's what happened in 2020. They just literally changed the election procedures through the judicial system. Or you had local agencies just say, we know this is what we're supposed to do, but because of COVID, we're going to do this. Completely changing the rules of how you govern elections. Those are the two key things that happen. And of course, what happens in a lot of in our areas when people are just sitting around, absentee ballots are going out ad nauseum, no requests, no checks. Then you have outside groups going to harvest those ballots to the tens of thousands, to the millions. When you look at the entirety of the country, that's how you get a Joe Biden with 81 million votes. He ain't getting 81 million votes again. There's no I way. I don't see and then, it. And There's then no we're way. watching. We're hip to the game. Yeah. We're paying attention. We are investing in this. And I want to tell you why you're not crazy to think that the election was stolen. If you mean to tell me that in the last election, Joe Biden got 81 million votes. President Trump got about 76 million votes. Mm-hmm. So let's just, let's just say that's 156 million votes. There were 180 million registered voters that year. That's like the 90 plus percent voter participation rate. Never happened. 180 million that's, that's, registered, 156. That's tally. unbelievable. It's never happened. That's no. unbelievable. That that's not. By the way, these are real numbers. Just go look them up. Like these yes. are these are real numbers. And so when you look at that, people like me say, "Hold on, that doesn't that doesn't that that doesn't add up to me. Like like that doesn't make any sense." Um, and it's okay to question that. Now that There's we have videos, we saw the videos. We saw the videos. Like we, we saw know the, we saw the ballot harvest. Oh, the drop boxes. Yes. The drop boxes, and it kept coming out, and the tens of thousands of dead people that somehow voted. Yeah, I'm giving you the wrong number. No, no, it's was 156 and 161 million registered voters. 156. That's what so there's only a five million. You, vote you are correct. Person, you are difference. correct. So it was like a 95 percent voter, voter participation rate that year. 95. Which, which is impossible. And, and these are look, these are real numbers. Not 180. It was 161. Yes. Which is which is which impossible. is impossible. Yeah. That's my point, though. They have perfected the game. Yeah. Um, Republicans have been behind, and I don't think have overall, from at that level, run good campaigns for, I don't know. I, mean, I go back to when I really, really started, fo- <laughs> started focusing 90s, 2000. Certainly when you look at 2008 and how brilliant the Obama campaign was with so many basic level things, going deep dive into Facebook and getting that demographic, it was, it was easy. Hope and change, the music. All, like, it was right. brilliant. That's right. It worked. And Republicans have been um, way behind in that, uh, generally speaking. Tell Trump. But uh, yes. Because this is the next. This is the biggest rock star we've seen since. since old, I remember. I remember Barack Obama's rallies. Obama, I mean, he yeah. was incredible. Yeah. But Trump. this is different. I've never been to one to a Trump one. Oh. I know. Oh, you, oh, we gotta get you there. <laughs> oh, that's gonna Listen, happen. Listen, I'm out of the closet now. Now we're gonna, we're gonna get the one, the one in Texas will be bigger than the one in Florida. <laughs> See, see, you see what you're trying to do? Okay, so you're, <laughs> see what you're trying to so, do? You're such a diplomat. No, no, you know I'm not. That's the part why I'm in trouble all the time. But I want to go see all of it. Yeah. I want to go see all of it because I do think this is just such an important time, um, you know, in our country. But I just want it to be honest. Yeah. May the best man win, truly. And that's what I, I don't trust anymore. And I think that's, that's the problem. I think you hit it on the head. One of the core things, we talked about the economy, foreign policy, inflation a little bit. Americans are losing trust in the yeah, institutions. Yeah, there's no trust. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be lectured by the Democrats anymore talking about how they're here to save democracy and save our institutions because we see what they're actually doing every single On day. the House floor. It's it, unbelievable. It erodes the trust in the institutions. There's a lot of, obviously, because of what's happened to President Trump in lower Manhattan and, you know, Jack Smith and all that kind of stuff, and his crazy self, you have this two-tier system of justice politically in our country now. What I warn my Democrat colleagues of is that you cannot persecute your political rivals because everybody sees that's phony and it's fake and it's only for power purposes. It's not for the law. It's not for justice. Donald Trump got 500 million reasons to prove to the world why that is how the American people feel. That dog won't hunt. But it's also bigger than that. Our system, our country, our constitution, our system of of checks and balances, our legal system is all really predicated on the honor system. People will follow the law if they truly believe the laws are just. People will listen to institutions if they feel that the institutions are honorable and have their best interests at heart. But when you lie to people about social distancing and masks and COVID-19, 
when you weaponize the system, the Department of Justice against your political rival, when you basically try to weaponize and increase massive amounts of IRS agents just to get everybody's uh, uh, change out of their couch cushions to feed it into a federal government that just more IRS wastes agents? money? From what? It just wastes money on From top what? of wasting money? People lose respect. They lose trust. trust. And when you lose that, you can't have a society. So we're the ones who are fighting for the democracy in America. We're the ones who are fighting to stabilize our institutions so they're respected. So people can look at the institutions and say, I may agree, I may disagree, but they're doing it honorably. And I will respect that. That's all I think most people want. We're all sports fans. That like, please, officials, just, just, be fair. just call just, the just game the right in call. the first quarter the same as you are in the fourth quarter. We just want consistency. Like, it's so simple. Yeah. Um, finally, you both, I know, believe this. You've said it. You said it many times, not just today. Um, the, the priorities for black people are the priorities for America. That's correct. Period. That's correct. So, yes, we are here. You are here to, to, to talk and kind of go grassroots, deep level on some of these issues um, with black male voters, which we're doing tonight. It's going to be a blast. Big picture. What do you want to say? What do you want American voters to know as they, hey, this is all coming to a head. It's July. You've heard it what all. Are, what, yeah. You've like, heard it all. You're the, going to hear this. You're going to hear a lot right. of this stuff again. Good. Because this is, this is what we did last time. It resonated extraordinarily well. And like, again, I'm not going to talk down to black people. We're smart. We can figure it out. I'm going to talk to you like I'm going to talk to anybody else. And you're, you're going to figure it out. You know why? Because we're all educated Americans here. And I, quite frankly, am sick and, I'm sick and tired of talking the black vote this, the black vote that. We have to do that. We have to say that because we are partitioned off by demographics, and I, and I do get that. But I like the Morgan Freeman approach. I don't want Black History Month Thank anymore. you. I don't want it to, I want to get to the point to where we aren't talking about Black anything. We are talking about American issues. We're pretty close to getting there, I think, if we would just get out of our own way. And then I'll end with this, and, and this is something that's really important to me, that I will always want to leave people with hope and to keep some historical perspective about our country. This is not the worst we've been. No. This country has been in far worse shape. The world has been in far worse shape. Yes, I will admit this is the worst I've seen in my lifetime. But again, what your father went through, what my father went through during the Vietnam era where we had American soldiers returning home and they were being spat on by fellow Americans. And when I came home, I came home to a, to a, to a hero's welcome. I can't imagine a world at war, not once, but twice. And we are the country that rid the world of fascism, and we are the reason why the world doesn't speak German. Yeah. So you're welcome. Mm. The Civil War, where we ripped each other apart behind slavery. The Civil Rights Movement. These are all issues where this country was extraordinarily splintered, and we still made it. It is the American spirit fire that I think at the end of the day, because of a diversity and because of where we all come from, at the end of the day, we always get it right. And the day is always darkest before the dawn. This is a nadir for us that I don't think we have seen in a very long time, but the zenith is right around the corner. And that's what this whole election is all about. That's what President Trump is all about. That's why we're doing so well. And that's why we're traveling around the country because what I believe in is the hope for a brighter future because Americans always get it right when our backs are against the wall. Our backs are against the wall, so we're going to get it right. Get it right. All of us. Not just us. All of us. All of us. All of us. I, meant, I mean that. All I, of I know us. you do, and that's what makes me all happy, because it is about all of us together, you know? Um, I just want to thank you for doing this. I don't mean this show today. I mean in general. Um, getting on those airplanes and schlepping your bag all across the country to have the conversation, because that's what we need. Um, I'm going to let you grade me on this, um, but... When I was a kid, my dad made us memorize the cadet prayer at West Point. That one you little— still know it? No, just this one little chunk. Okay. And I don't know if I know it perfectly. You can surely let me know if I screw it up. Okay. question is, do you still know it? <laughs> I'm sitting here. Let's I'm not sitting here. You see me, sir? <laughs> let, let me, me help. <laughs> I'll grade you. What is it? What is it? What is it? Go ahead. Help me to choose the harder right Over, yep. instead of the, the easier, easier wrong. wrong. And to never be content with when a half-truth when the, whole, when can the be. whole can be one. You get A+. Plus. Thank you. But that's what you're doing. Get you a, are a choosing plus. A plus. the harder right Over by being wrong. here, by talking about it, by being okay when you get 
in those tough conversations when you get canceled, when you get all the things, when you lose endorsements, when you lose it all. It's friends, the harder right. I've lost friends, family. Yeah. I, I, I understand. Yes, it's the harder right, and you two are doing it. One of, or two of four? Two of four in the four. house. Two of four in the house, yeah. We need more. We're going to get more. And that's, because that's America. That's what America looks like. America doesn't look like that's that. That's what we want. Yes. God bless you guys. God bless and you. Thank, thank you. you and let's have fun the next couple months. Right? Why not? We got, we got a lot of fun tonight. Great. Starting went, tonight with the cognac and the cigar. Tonight, you're... Uh, keep the cigar smoke away from me, okay? Okay. okay.